good day. <clears throat> I had asked, um, Tim, Tim was going to open this morning, but I had asked if I could just share a few words. Um, and I don't want to start off the service with fear or doubt or sadness. I'm just, because I know God's good. He's good all the time. Um, I just want to walk you through what my family and I have experienced these past two weeks, which it's really been a battle in my mind. Um, we've been traveling to South Carolina for the past nine years. <clears throat> sometimes we go in the fall, sometimes we go in the spring. And some of you know my youngest brother lives down there. So uh, we've also created a special bond with the pastor and his wife and their children, whom we've considered family for these past nine years. Uh, they have four children, three girls and a boy. <clears throat> and they took my brother in nine years ago and have treated him like their own. Two Sundays ago, we were sitting and we had just finished up Sunday dinner. <clears throat> my son saw a post on Facebook from their oldest daughter asking prayers for Miles, which is the, uh, the only son of the pastor and his wife. So I text my brother to see what was up. And a second later, <clears throat> uh, he had called me and he had asked us all to grab hands and rebuke the spirit of death over Miles' life. <laughs> Ten minutes later, my brother Joe called, and the hospital had pronounced him dead. Miles was 16 years old. He was passionate about Jesus. In fact, he had led, they said he had led 15 teens to the Lord in the last two months. So the tragic accident happened like this. They were... They had had uh, damage from the hurricane that went through there a couple months ago, or a month ago. And they were all at Toby and Laura's house cleaning off trees off their, off their home. And Joe said that he and the pastor were back helping lift a tree off the home. And there was a guy up on a ladder, and he was trying to use a rope and pulley to pull the tree off the house. Well, they said they heard a gunshot. And they looked at each other like, what in the world? And the guy up on the ladder said, somebody needs to come. Some kid has been tragically hit with the gun. So they went running. My brother and Joe, or my brother and the pastor were first on the scene. They said that two kids that Miles was trying to get saved, they were hanging out with him. They pulled up to help remove trees. One of the kids was showing off a rifle, and Miles kept telling him, put the gun away, put it away. And the kid kept telling Miles, he said, it's not loaded. He goes, I wouldn't be that dumb, it's not loaded. So Miles gets behind the passenger side of the door, <clears throat> and he told him one more time, he said, Get, put that gun away. Well, to prove it wasn't loaded, he pulled the trigger. And it went through the the side uh, from the driver's side that went through the passenger window, it hit Miles on the side of the face and down by his jugular. <clears throat> and um, Toby and Joe, again, were first on the scene. They rolled Miles over. Toby's begging God and pleading with God to let him live. He said he put his mouth on his mouth. He was hearing for sign of life. <clears throat> and they ended up putting him on the, the stretcher. The grandma and the grandpa were there too. They were praying miles to live. And the uh, ambulance ended up taking him and then at the hospital they had pronounced him dead. So as you know, it's been a tragic thing for my family. In your mind, you wonder why and how, how this could be, <clears throat> why he had to die. And God instantly led me to the Bible of the Shunammite's son. And then he led me to Lazarus. 
the Shumanite son was working in a field. You guys probably know the story. Hit in the head. He was pronounced dead. And the mud, all the mother kept saying was, it is well. It is well. Every time she knew that he was dead, every time they would ask, she would just say, it is well. The prophet Elijah prayed to God, laid on the child. The Bible says, child sneezes seven times, and he comes to life. Lazarus, as you all know, <clears throat> was dead in the tomb for four days when Jesus called him forth and he lived. And a few verses later, after Jesus raises him up, he tells the people that if they believe in him, they will do the same works he did, even greater. So I thought to myself, why these verses, Lord? We just dealt with the death of a child. Why these verses? And the only thing that I can think of is the enemy was trying to take me down to doubt, to fear. He was trying to take my mind in a different direction, and God was just trying to keep me focused on his truth. Because a second, uh, two days later, I was vacuuming out my car, and the Lord spoke to my spirit. He said, my words are true, and they are faithful. So I don't know why Miles had to die that day, why his flesh passed on. I, but I do know is I'm going to continue to lay hands on the sick, the dead, the hurting, the less fortunate, and believe God at his word. He gave me a vision of an arrow being shot from a bow. <clears throat> and that arrow piercing and nailing its target. So we have to get it sewed down deep in us when our natural eyes see the gunshot wound or a bank report or our ears hear the bad report we have to see god's word penetrating those false hopes and believe his word will pierce and destroy the situation so it lines up with his truth he is god when we're on top of the mountain and he is god when we're low in the valley yes. and i know that his word will not fail unfortunately i don't know what happened that day why Miles didn't live, but I do know God's word is still his word, and it yes. is truth. Yes. And if we stand on that word, he, all things are possible, is what the Bible says. Yes, Lord. So what we're finding comfort and hope in is that when Miles closed his eyes, he glimpsed heaven, and that was it for him. He probably was just like, I don't know anything else but the glory of God. But if I just want to ask that you guys please keep the Davis family and my brother Joe, they, they saw the tragedy of it all. Um, they say every time they close their eyes, that's all they see. So just that God will, I pray God will give them a glimpse of miles in heaven and that beauty that's, that's in there and surrounding yes. miles. Um, yes. But for anybody else, if you're, if you're going through things where it seems like things are falling, 10,000 are falling here and 1,000 are falling there. Just keep focused on what God's word is telling us because yeah. it does work. It does work. So that's the encouragement. All that tragedy. So anyway, does anybody have a testimony? Or? Uh, Myron uh, texted me a little bit ago. He's uh, facing pain again. The healing is there uh, physically. Apparently there's some nerve damage or something that's going on that's giving him the symptoms of not being healed. So we just need to pray for him and help him understand the healing and stand with him that the healing is already on its way. Right. It's already manifesting, so this pain will also just disappear. Amen. Amen. Yes, the Lord. Anybody else mm -hmm. have a testimony? Yes. Well, um, as many of you know from Facebook, the Lord's healed me of diabetes. <laughs> Yes. So three months ago when I was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, my numbers were so high, they said it, it would take years for me and, and rigorous things to get the numbers down. And my numbers are actually below a pre-diabetic level now into normal after Woo. three months.
to other people that are managing projects. And so, you know, that's just not a good thing because, right. you know, the Lord put my boss in authority over me, not these other people. Mm-hmm. Right, yeah. mm-hmm. Amen. Glory. Amen. Glory. Anybody else? Okay, we can just stand and go to the Lord in prayer. Thank you, God, for your goodness, Lord. We know that all things are possible through you, God. We know that when we speak your word in truth, in spirit, God, we know that you are on the throne, God. Lord, I pray for the Davises, Lord, that you will comfort their spirit, Lord. God, lift them up, God, in a way that you have never lifted them, God, through these times, Lord. The devil is a liar. He is under our footstool, God. We know that if we keep our eyes focused on you, Lord, that these things, God, will diminish, Lord. We know, God, that your word is powerful. It is all-knowing. It is all-loving, God. Shower us, Lord, in these last days as these things try to crop up, God. Let us know, Lord, that the greater one is in us. The greater one, God, who is you, Lord. We are one together, God. There is nothing impossible. There is nothing impossible for you, God, if we believe. I just thank you, God, for being God over our lives, Lord, for protecting our youth, our children, God. We know, Lord, that there is a calling on the youth, God, that their, that their work, God, here on earth is going to be led by you, Lord, that the world is going to see the miracles and the wonders And they are going to know that you are God. You are God. The enemy is under our footstool, Lord. He is under us, God. There is nothing impossible for you, Lord. Your word is like a two-edged sword. Where unto we send it, God, it will not return void. Thank you, God. Thank you for the hope, Lord. Thank you for your love. I praise you, God. I thank you for this day, Lord. Now we pray, God, that the word that's going to come forth from the pastor, Lord, that it will pierce our ears, God, that we will go out and show the world the light, the great light. Thank you, God, for your truth. Thank you, God, for peace. For peace that passes all understanding, God. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you. Okay, if you have a a cell phone on, we're asking that you just turn it to vibrate or completely off. And we will speak the word because the word is truth and where and when we open our mouths and speak it. It, it will go and do the thing it's supposed to do. Yeah, so, will you not revive, revive us again you. that your people you may rejoice in you? Thank you, God. I am a believer, and these signs do follow me. In the name of Jesus, I cast out demons, I speak in new tongues, I lay hands on the sick, and they do recover. Yes, go. Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. Therefore, I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body. Every disease, germ, and every virus that touches this body dies instantly in the name of Jesus. Every organ, every tissue of this body functions to the perfection to which God created its function. And I forbid any malfunction in this body in the name of Jesus. I receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of my understanding being enlightened, and I am not conformed to this world, but I'm transformed by the renewing of my mind. My mind is renewed by the word of God. The Lord rebukes the devourer for my sake, and no weapon that is formed against my finances will prosper. All obstacles and hindrances to my financial prosperity are now dissolved. The Lord has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant, and Abraham's blessings are mine. Yes, Lord. Uh, Toby and Peter.
You want to come up and take the offering? <clears throat>
what gets me is never doubt, because I'm human, and, and so I've just been dealing with diabetes, type 2. The, de the doctor thinks it's medicine. So here's the thing. I, I was diagnosed in July. My blood, my A1C, which is, it's awesome the way the Lord made the body, because he made it so that our blood cells recreate themselves every two to three months. And your A1C is a measure of that. And the Bible tells us the life of anything is in its blood. So your blood is so important. And, and blood cells have a memory. And so that's part of the problem is they say I, diabetes is a progressive disease, so your cells kind of remember where they're at. And because of that, it once damage is done a lot of times, it's it's hard to reverse that damage. So, you know, I'm praying to be healed of diabetes because, you know, I'm thinking, I didn't order this, you know, Lord, I it's a horrible disease. I, you know, people go blind from it, they lose limbs from it, they they it's a five style change. And I doubt it. I mean I
Thank you, Jesus. Let's all right now, let's say yes to the Lord. Whatever your need is today, if you need healing, say yes to the Lord. If you need breakthrough in any area, say yes to the Lord right now. Praise God. Whatever the need, whatever your burden, whatever came with you when you came here this morning, leave it with the Lord. Just say, yes, Lord. I trust in your faith. Not my faith. My faith can waver. My, my doubts come and they go. But we believe in the faith of the Son of God who gave himself for us. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Your word is the final word in every situation, in every circumstance, everywhere, for everyone. In Jesus' mighty name. Praise the Lord. Give the Lord a great hand this morning. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Amen, amen. God bless you all. You may be seated. Sunday school kids, you can be dismissed. Thank you, Jody. Appreciate it very much. Well, well presented, and I know that's a heartbreaking situation for you guys and for the entire family and everybody involved there. But we look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Yes. Praise the Lord. Some things, some things won't make any sense to us till we get to heaven, but we know what the Word of God says, and that's what we stand on. Amen. Yes. This is a fallen world, and God's given us authority, so mm -hmm. if we don't exercise the authority, we've got to deal with the with results. Amen. Right. Praise God. Amen. God bless all of you. Appreciate you being here this morning. Amen. God is good. Hallelujah. Yeah. We're going to start <clears throat> this morning in Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, I would like to read verses 4 through 10 talk to you a little bit this morning about our identity. <clears throat> the enemy comes and tells us it's our fault, whatever happens, you know, this happened, that happened, that, you know, either, either God's angry at you and so he's punishing or, or you just screwed up so bad that you deserve whatever it is that's happening to you. And all of those things are the way the enemy manipulates the way that we think and, of course, the way that we think determines how we then act. Praise mm -hmm. the Lord. So language is a, you know, a strange thing, and especially the English language. Uh, I don't know how anyone from other countries ever figures out how to speak and make any sense out of it, but of course I get misunderstood all the time, and that's as much my fault as <laughs> anybody else's, praise the Lord. But I mean, for, just think, what kind of a language? I mean, if, if English made any sense, <coughs> lackadaisical would be a shortage of flowers, right? Let's go to the Word of God. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy for his love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ by grace you are saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Praise the Lord. So right after Paul writes about salvation as a gift of grace, he explains the why behind the gift. Because we are God's masterpiece. The New Living Translation says we are his masterpiece. Here it's, 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 it says workmanship. And workmanship, I've looked this up, it's, it's used seven times in the Old Testament. And, of course, that's Hebrew. And it's, it's defined as God's work or God's property every time. Of the seven times that it's used in Scripture, six times it's used in the Old Testament, each of those six times, it's defined as workmanship, 
That's the translation workmanship, and it means God's work or God's property. The one time that it's used in the New Testament is here in Ephesians. And here it's Greek, and the word translates masterpiece. So that changes everything. This truth is that God looks at us with all of our failings, with all of our imperfections, all of our weaknesses, doubts, and he declares us to be his masterpiece. Praise God. Think about it. When God saw all of his creation, the, the constellations, you know, the, the stars, the oceans, the seas, the, the lakes, the rivers, the flowers, the colors, the, you know, the creation, the creatures themselves, and, and uh, all, of, all of these, the mountains, and everything that is awesome, you know, to us. And then God says, we humans are the best yes. of his creation. Yes. The work that he's most proud of and whom he chooses to dwell in, mm -hmm. to leave his presence in. Mm -hmm. After all, we are made in his image. Yes. Yes. Psalms chapter 2, uh, verses 7 and 8 takes it even a step further. Prophetically, David's speaking about the coming Messiah, about God coming in the flesh. And here's the way he relates it back to us, is that I'll declare the decree the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Mm -hmm. An inheritance. Not only are we a masterpiece, we are an inheritance for Jesus. Yes. Yes. John 17, verse 24. See, the devil convinces us that we are just, just a little above the earthworms, you know, and that it's always a challenge. God's never going to see any good in any of us. He just kind of turns a blind eye to all, to all of our mm -hmm. despicable humanity. When in fact he declares us to be a masterpiece yes, and so valuable that he gives it to Jesus, this masterpiece, as an inheritance. Mm -hmm. yes. Each and every one of us. Amen? Amen? He says, Father, I will that they also, this is Jesus speaking, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, the inheritance he's talking be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. So, we aren't just God's masterpiece, we are Jesus' inheritance. And that plays out here in uh, John 17, where Jesus is praying this just before he goes through the garden and, and to be arrested. Amen? So it's an important thing to him, obviously, right? Look, go back to Ephesians, if you will now, Sheila, to chapter 1, verse 18. Ephesians 1, verse 18. Ephesians 17? Ephesians 1, verse 18. Okay. Talking about the eyes of our understanding. Oh, Ephesians 1, verse 18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, yes. what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Yes. Validating what I've just said, that this is what yes. God's talking about. <laughs> so the understanding of who we are to God, the masterpiece, the inheritance, that's huge. Yes. I mean, it's, it's beyond, uh, you know, comprehension in some, to some degree. Right. So when you hear the accusations of the enemy relative to sin or to shortcomings or failings or, or fears or anxieties or doubts or uncertainties, yeah. amen, it's the enemy. Yes. It's not God. Right. We hear it and we think, oh, God's condemning me because I had that doubt. I, I questioned this or I wasn't sure. And I, I'm believing, but I'm right. doubting at the same time. Right. That's not God talking to you. 
That's the enemy. And we need to recognize if God sees me as a masterpiece and as an inheritance, he's not dissing me about my imperfection when it comes even to faith. That's right. I'm believing in his faith. I'm trusting yes. in his yes. faith. Yes. Praise yes. the Lord. Yes. Amen. So yes. we think it's God's voice and it's the enemy voice. Yes. I'm going to tell you, let me just tell you a little story. This is kind of ugly, but we're all adults here, so I'll just share it with you because grow up if you're not. <laughs> Sally and I knew a worship leader who uh, they're not here. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, thank you. Who uh, had an affair with a married woman. And she got pregnant. Now that's bad enough. But the worship leader then hired somebody to kill the husband of the woman that he had the affair with. I'll just tell you who it is. That worship leader was David. Yep. King David. Who after his death, God said, he was a man after my own heart. Obviously, I'm not condoning, nor does God condone adultery or murder or any of those things. I'm just saying that is a reality. If there was ever anyone who had reason to doubt God's goodness and God's favor, it would have been somebody that had committed those types of crimes to feel like he deserved whatever he got. God never pulled him out of his leadership role. In fact, he told him, every one of your descendants will sit on this throne. So again, we're not justifying the behavior. I'm saying God loves us in such a way that nothing we do changes his mind about us. Praise the Lord. It's time that we, as a church, confront the lies with the truth of who God says we are. Yes. Through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have been declared the righteousness of God in Christ. Yes. Yes. An inheritance, a masterpiece of yes. God's. Yes. Psalms 103, verse 12. He says, David writing again. He doesn't know anything about your sin. He has, because he's God, he's able to say, it's never happened. Yes. Not only don't I remember it, it doesn't exist. As far as the east is from the west, so far have he removed yes. our transgressions yes. from us. Thank the Lord. Praise the Lord. Wow. And God does it because he has such a great love for us right. as his master. You know, we, we have a tendency to define ourselves and others by the present situation or the immediate circumstance. But God sees us according to our destiny. He sees the end from the beginning. God looks at us and calls us great because he knows that we really are his masterpiece. Romans chapter 4, verse 17. We need to start looking at things the way God looks at things. Yes. As though they are. Yes. Even if they're not. Right. As it is written, I made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they are. Yes. We'd be one of those things. Yes. Amen. Because in the natural, in our present circumstances, in our situations, we look at one another, we look at ourselves in the mirror, and we say, oh, what a mess. But God sees the end from the beginning. He sees what we don't see, and he declares us to be the righteousness of God, his masterpiece, so valuable that he gives us as an inheritance to Jesus. Praise the Lord. It's important here to realize that God doesn't have human eyes. And he tells us to look. Eyes they have, but they see not. We've got God eyes. We were created in his image. We have the spirit of God. We have the ability to see through the eyes of God, but we don't many times. Right. So to begin with, God's eyes are not like our eyes. He doesn't have human eyes. 
And I want to show, I'll, I'll show you something here. How, to me, how profound the Bible is. How detailed it is. How yeah, the minutest things it'll bring about. In the Song of Solomon, which is <coughs> basically it's a, the whole thing is a metaphor mm -hmm. of Jesus and His bride. So in Song of Solomon, chapter five, verse twelve. Let me show you something here. Song of Solomon five, verse twelve. His eyes are as the eyes of doves by the rivers of water, washed with milk and fitly set. Now, I'm, I'm not a great bird watcher, although we have bird feeders and birds, and usually I spend most of my time throwing ears of corn out far enough to get the tree rats out of my bird feeder. <laughs> so I'm always throwing ears of corn out there to keep the squirrels eating the corn so they're not eating the stuff that's supposed to be for the birds constant battle and it gives me something to do. <laughs> but I know we've got at least two, two pair of doves that have been around our place ever since we've lived there. They'll set up on the peak of the house and coo and carry on and then they, they're ground feeders. I mean they don't get up in the bird feeder. They eat everything that gets spilled over. Mm -hmm. So I, I watch them. You know people always say, free as a bird. You ever notice a bird? They're, they're not free, believe me. They're looking for the enemy all the time, except for doves. Doves are different. For one thing, they mate for life. They're faithful to their mate, who, whatever, you know, they're, they're together forever for their entire lifetime. Not like, you know, other birds are always raiding other nests and so on and so forth. But they are completely loyal to their mates for life. And doves don't get distracted by things going on around them. The other birds are feeding them. They're constantly fussing with each other. The doves are like they're in another world. They'll peck around the ground and keep on keeping on. They don't, they're not distracted by everything. When a dove looks at its mate, it sees only its mate. It doesn't see anything else. And that's what God is like towards us. Luke 11 33 through 36. His eyes are the eyes of doves. No man, when he hath lighted a candle, put it under the secret place, neither under a bushel, but on a candlestick that they which come in may see the light. The light of the body is the eye, therefore when thine eye is single, thy whole body also is full of light. But when thy eye is evil, thy body also is full of darkness. Take heed, therefore, that the light which is in thee be not darkness. Mm -hmm. If thy whole body, therefore, be full of light, having no part dark, the whole shall be full of light, as when the bright shining of a candle doth give thee light. Mm -hmm. Now, here it's, it's, it's basically saying evil and darkness are synonymous. Mm -hmm. And so... Dark is evil. Light is good. It's revelation. It's, it's, it represents God, right? So when Jesus, the bridegroom, looks at you and me, his gaze is totally directed at our heart and not our sin. He sees our spirit and not the darkness. And I'm going to show you Another example of this in Song of Solomon, chapter 1 and verse 5. I'm black but comely. O ye daughters of Jerusalem, as the tents of Kedar, as the curtains of Solomon, and you can read on about this, but I'm just saying that that's, I'm sinful, right? But what God is telling us here is that we may be dark, but we're beautiful to God. Amen. We may not be perfect the way the world would define perfection, but God doesn't see that. What he sees is our beauty. Yes. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder in this case, yes. and it's God's eyes. Amen. He doesn't see the way we see. He has eyes like a dove. He looks to our spirit. He sees it. He's forever faithful. I'll never leave you or forsake you. You are my bride. Will always be my bride. Nothing can ever take your place. The 
key to unlocking our destiny is learning to lean on our identity in Christ. Our identity, our destiny, has to be established in our relationship with God, in his love for us, right. not in our love for him. Right. Yes, we yes. want to love him, and we do love him, but our love is imperfect. Right. Yep. But his isn't. That's right. His is absolute, yes. finished, Thank you, God. complete. Amen? Yes, Second Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. And you know, we read all through the Old Testament about idolatry. The problem is we have idolatry in the New Covenant. And we're the idol. Yeah. So the enemy's idea, he's not, he's not foolish enough to stick up some half fish, half human, you know, part dog, part something else in front of us and say, hey, that, there's God for you. Worship that. No. He points to all of our failures, all of our weaknesses. If we start focusing on that, focusing yeah. on that, the next thing you know, we become our idol. Yeah. Mm, that's we crazy. become the thing that we're focused on right. instead of God. We're the thing that we're, we're putting all of our attention to instead of him. And that's what is in 2 Corinthians 3.18, that's what he's talking about. We are with an open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So we become like what we worship. And if our focus is always on us, we may not be bowing down and, and uh, you know praising ourselves, but our focus is on us. And we become transformed to what we focus on. So if our focus is me and my failures and my weakness, that's my reality. Yeah, that's right. I become an idol. I become an idolater. Yeah. Not believing God, but believing me, right. believing my weakness, believing my failure, believing my doubts, believing my questions instead right. of believing in the word of God, which is precisely what Jody was talking about and Peter. Woo. So when you're confronted with these things, see, you're, you're forced into a situation where you have to make a decision. The facts are telling me one thing. But the Word of God is telling me something else. Now I can see the facts, but I don't always see the manifestation of the Word of God in the immediate situation. So now I'm left with a choice. Am I going to believe me, my intellect, my momentary vision of whatever the situation or the circumstance is, or am I going to believe God? Yes. So I'm either in idolatry, or worshiping God. Right. Beholding Him or beholding me. Right. Praise the Lord. Amen. When we continually behold our sin rather than God's glory, God's love, yes. God's goodness, sin becomes my identity. Yes. Mm. yes. That's right. That's right. More shame, more condemnation, yeah. more sorrow, more fear. More uncertainty. Mm. It's idolatry. Yes. Mm. Yes. Jesus died on the cross for every past, present, future sin. Yes, Lord. It's all under the blood. Yes. It Lord. is all under the yes. blood. If you yes. have believe, if you yes. just accept and believe, even with our you know fractured belief system. Yeah. Right. He understands our humanity. Yes. And so as believers. Sin can never legally be used for accusation or shame or condemnation by any other human or by any other being for that matter. Yes. Somebody condemns you, write it off. Yeah. It's not God. Mm. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. It's the enemy. Yes. If he comes to you and starts telling you about how horrible you are, you didn't do that right, you should have responded differently to that. I'm not saying we shouldn't learn and try to grow and be better people. I'm just saying that's not the, the criteria that God is using. God is using the finished product. He's using the finished work. Jesus said it's finished. And when he said it was finished, he meant it's finished. It's finished for him. It's finished for us. It's finished for everybody. Yes, Lord. Yes. Because God has declared the end from the beginning. Yes. You are the righteousness of God. You are a masterpiece. Yes. You have such value. Then he declares you to be the inheritance. Glory. Jesus. Glory. That's our identity in Christ. Jesus. Yes. We're the masterpiece of God. Yes. The inheritance of Jesus Christ. Last scripture here. Let's look at this. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, verses 18 through 23. 1 Peter 1, 18 through 23. 
who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him you believe in God, that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, mm -hmm. that your faith and hope might be in God, mm -hmm. not in you. Yes. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. That chapter, verse 22 there is critical to the whole thing that God has done. Right. I can't, what am I gonna, how am I gonna love God? What am I gonna do for God? The only thing I can do for God is to be a blessing to his inheritance. Right. Is to love the way right. he loved me. That's the way I identify. That's the way God sees my expression yes. of gratitude. Right. Not that it's, if I never did it, it would have changed a thing. Right. But it wouldn't be. It would limit the body. It would limit the pride. It would diminish what God wants us all to know and to understand right. and to live in. Right. So, See that you have purified your souls and obeyed the truth of the spirit of the unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart, fervently, uh -huh. being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Amen. Praise the Lord. God is dedicated to taking us into the future as healed, restored, whole. Let God be true.